everyone. I'm Paul Perry. I'm the Director of Education for the National Museum of the U.S. Navy. And as some of you know, today is Hispanic, or this month actually, is Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, it's a very important uh, month for the museum in terms of programming. And uh, we're very happy today to have uh, someone uh, from the United States Navy Band talk about uh, the Navy's first, the Navy Band's first uh, bandmaster of Hispanic descent. And so we're going to go ahead and um, uh, have Chief McDonald talk to you about that. You have some uh, bio information on the program on your seats. Also, some information about our upcoming programs. So I hope you enjoy it, and please uh, welcome Chief Kevin McDonald. Thank you so much, Mr. Perry. Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Museum of the U.S. Navy. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Chief Kevin McDonald. I am the historian and head archivist for your Navy music program. And we are based here at the historic Washington Navy Yard in DC. And it's just always such a pleasure to come over and partner with the museum. So we're, we're very happy to be here. Um, and one more thank you to Paul Perry for putting this together. Our partnership with the Navy Museum is something that we cherish and it's really, really amazing. So I will start by saying, Happy Navy birthday. Here we are on the 14th of October. The 13th of October, 1775 is of course uh, your Navy's birthday. So we are still celebrating uh, the day after here in our nation's capital. And the reason we're here today, the Department of Defense observes National Hispanic Heritage Month from 15 September to 15 October each year. During this time, we honor the culture and contributions of persons who trace their origin or descent to Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Central and South America, and other Hispanic cultures. People who identify as Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish may be of any race. The National Observance began in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week uh, under President Lyndon B. Johnson in 1988 President Ronald Reagan expanded the observance to cover a 30-day period that encompassed the days of independence for Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, and Chile, as well as Columbus Day or Dia de la Raza. Later in 1988, the expanded observance was enacted into legislation via Public Law 100, TAC 402. This year's National Hispanic Heritage Month theme is Todos Somos, Somos Uno. We are all, we are one. This year's theme reflects the imperative of inclusivity, valuing both diversity of background and unity of purpose. Inclusivity enables the Department of Defense to harness the full potential and talent of diverse communities unified in the preservation and protection of military interests both at home and abroad. For generations, Hispanic Americans have demonstrated allegiance to our nation through military and public service. According to the Department of Defense demographic for 2022, over 8% of Department of Defense civilian employees identify as Hispanic, and approximately 19% of active duty military personnel identify as Hispanic or Latino. They are a vital component of our total force and in accomplishing our mission. Engaging the diverse talents, perspectives, and experiences of personnel with Hispanic heritage contributes to operational success. As we celebrate the achievements of our Hispanic military and civilian employees, the Department of Defense recognizes the operational advantages this diverse and dynamic community provides to operations both at home and abroad. So today, underways, tours, fleet weeks, cruises, and port calls have served as means to a few different ends for our Navy. To project power, to maintain or increase fleet visibility, to strengthen diplomatic relations, to encourage recruitment, and to boost the morale of shipboard sailors. Throughout naval history, 
such missions have served as successful conduits for recruitment, citizenship, diversity, and belonging, most especially for your Navy music program. Today's National Hispanic Heritage Month presentation focuses on bandmaster Belisario Contreras, a, a decorated oboist, woodwind instrumentalist, and eventually a bandmaster with a permanent appointment right here at the U.S. Navy Band at the historic Washington Navy Yard in D.C., and he led some of the most high-profile engagements of the 1920s and 1930s. Although discrimination against Hispanic sailors is not well documented, retired Master Chief Mike Bays has argued that Hispanic sailors were often tasked with menial labor jobs and could be harassed by crew members. One sailor who not only persevered, but thrived in our Navy in spite of any discrimination was Bandmaster Belisario Contreras. Along with Chief Alton Adams, Contreras was one of the first minority bandmasters in the Navy, breaking barriers during the World War I era that wouldn't be addressed en masse until World War II and after. Contreras was born in Barcelona, Spain on 20 October 1887. I think it's very fitting here that we're, we're coming together on the 14th of October when uh, Bandmaster Contreras' birthday is just would, would have just been a few days away. So the 20th of October in 2023 would be his 136th birthday. So I, I love the, the, the scheduling of this particular talk. I mentioned that Contreras was born in Barcelona. However, Contreras became a Chilean national sometime before 1908. And we will talk more about Contreras' place of birth a little bit later in this discussion. So how and where did Contreras connect with our Navy? For that, we return to the idea of international cruises as conduits for recruitment, especially for our Navy music program. By order of then President Teddy Roosevelt, a group of 16 battleships <clears throat> from Atlantic Fleet circ circumnavigated the globe from 16 December 1907 to 22 February 1909. The squadron's hulls were painted jet white, then our Navy's peacetime color scheme, and funnily enough, very similar to what a great white shark looks like in the water. And so the squadrons were popularly billed as the Great White Fleet. The fleet's primary mission was twofold, diplomatic visits to allies and power projection for potential adversaries. On 16 December 1907, the fleet departed Hampton Roads, Virginia. At the time, the Panama Canal had not yet been completed. After a visit in Port of Spain, Trinidad, the fleet embarked on a four-month voyage around South America and through the Straits of Magellan. During February 1908, the fleet cruised up the Chilean coast. Chilean nationals, including Contreras, witnessed the squadrons parade in review and perform maneuvers for the entertainment of crowds ashore. One onlooker described the spectacle. The 16 battleships roared out a salvo such that no one in Chile had ever heard before. The effect of the thunder was electric. On the 20th of January 1909, Contreras enlisted in our Navy out of Valparaiso as a musician, second class oboe and woodwind instrumentalist stationed aboard the armored cruiser USS Maryland. According to the documents that we have on file, he stood five feet, five inches tall, and weighed 151 pounds, and indicates that his, quote, parents were first to this country, the country being the U.S., end quote. By contrast, his subsequent reenlistment documents and 1941 Selective Service draft card for World War II list Barcelona, Spain as his place of birth. Correspondence from his daughter-in-law confirms that he was born in Barcelona, Spain. So that is what we're going with for the, for, the, for the purposes of our discussion today. The thing that I would like to bring up is that it just points to the complexity of the immigration process around the turn of the century. The, the early 20th century was a time of an influx of immigration, a lot of it through military service. And it, these documents where there might be different information in different areas just to me signifies how complex that process is for the immigration process. 
Contreras' wife, Teresa, was born on 10 September 1892 in Valparaiso, Chile. Uh, their son, Belisario Jr., was born in 1916. So remember, he enlisted in 1909. Their son was born in 1916. There was a lot of travel going on with the family. I mentioned that his service began above the USS Maryland. Between 1916 and 1920, Contreras served aboard USS Memphis, USS Prairie, USS Hancock, USS Olympia. He served at Navy Yard New York, which today I believe we refer to as Fort Hamilton, which is in fact where I went to MEPS myself, Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn. And he served as a member of the military detachment of Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. The next few slides you'll see are shipboard photographs of some of Contreras' early duty stations. I think it's really fascinating when we look back to not only just looking at the posture of all the musicians that you see, but the uniforms. They're very interesting. Like what what things are different today, what things are similar, what working uniforms look like, what service uniforms look like, what dress uniforms look like. So there he is. I've tried to, anytime we have a photograph, I try to use a gold arrow to indicate where Pan Master Contreras is. There he's holding his oboe and another one. So via petition number 18,011, volume 74, Contreras successfully petitioned for naturalization on the 14th of March, 1918. At the time, Contreras was stationed at Navy Yard, New York, and his petition was filed via United States District Court in the Eastern District of New York. The documents we have indicate that he re-enlisted re on the 24th of May, 1920 in Norfolk, Virginia. So remember, there was a change in duty status between the 1918 and 1920, uh, which relocated him from Navy Yard, New York uh, to Norfolk, Virginia. Now, the letter you see on this slide, dated the 20th of July, 1920, confirms that his wife, Teresa, and their son, Belisario Jr., intended to sail from Valparaiso to New York above the SS, aboard the SS Santa Luisa on or about the 7th of August, 1920. Now, remember those dates and remember the vessel that we're talking about. This ship's manifest shows that, in fact, his wife, Teresa, and son, Belisario Jr., emigrated to the U.S. on the 21st of August, 1920. Again, that's later than their plan was on the 7th of August, aboard the SS Santa Teresa, not the Santa Luisa. I also think it's funny that Santa Teresa and then his wife was Teresa, so that's really fitting. Their final destination, rather than New York, in fact, according to this manifest, was Charleston, South Carolina. Our records are not exhaustive, but this could indicate a change in Contreras' duty station that would have delayed his family's departure from the 7th of August to the 21st of August and shifted their final destination from New York to Charleston. As we'll see, those duty stations were both around that time period. Speaking of duty stations, this middle part of Contreras' career included assignments aboard USS California, USS Tennessee, USS Hartford, recruiting station Norfolk, receiving station Charleston, we mentioned Charleston, and naval training station in Newport. Contreras is listed on the roster of instructors of the Navy Musician School in Newport, Rhode Island. Today, your Navy School of Music is actually based in Little Creek, Virginia. At mid-century, the Navy School of Music was actually right here in Washington, D.C., just across the river at receiving station Washington. <clears throat> but of course, yes, the, the music school, the, the Navy Music School of Music today is based in Little Creek, Virginia. I think it's really interesting seeing all the individuals in bow ties, and then you see these two enlisted personnel, one of whom is Bandmaster Contreras. During this middle part of Contreras' career, reenlistment documents indicate that he was promoted to musician first class, first musician, and was ultimately stationed in our nation's capital right here as a member of the Washington Navy Yard, oh dear, Navy Yard Band. There we go. Contreras arrived at receiving station Washington on the 23rd of May, 1924.
And this is a photograph of the band from 1924. Again, Contreras is identified by my gold arrows that I put in most of these photos. In 1925, President Calvin Coolidge signed Public Law 661, officially recognizing your United States Navy Band, formerly the Washington Navy Yard Band, as your Navy's flagship musical institution. As an original member of this ensemble, Contreras led high-profile ceremonies, frequently performing at the White House and aboard the USS Mayflower, PY-1, the presidential yacht, PY, signifying presidential yacht. One such ceremony featured Bandmaster Contreras supporting President Coolidge as our nation welcomed home Charles Lindbergh from his historic flight across the Atlantic in 1927. In 1929, Bandmaster Contreras helped welcome home Admiral Byrd from his historic trip and flight over the South Pole. Additionally, Contreras was heard on NBC radio in 1927 as part of Arthur Godfrey's Hour of Memory show. Now, I've looked everywhere for this recording. I'm still looking for this recording, so if there's anyone out there who happens to have a recording from the Arthur Godfrey Hours, Hour of Memory show from 1927, I would absolutely love that. So here is one more photograph of the band. This is a little bit later in 1931. I will mention that these particular uniforms might look a little bit different than what you may have seen your U.S. Navy band wearing. These are referred to as our lion tamer uniforms from this particular period. And speaking of period uniforms, you know, I mentioned that President Coolidge uh, officially recognized your United States Navy band as the Navy's flagship musical institution in 1925. That means that your United States Navy band has a big time centennial on the horizon. And one of those things that we're doing, our parts of our building are under construction and we will be revitalizing our entire historic vestibule, which also includes a period replica of these lion tamer uniforms. So again, Keep that on, keep your eyes out for the U.S. Navy Band Centennial coming up in 2025, and we'll talk more about that a bit later. But I thought the uniforms were particularly of interest. Once again, Contreras is identified by the gold arrow. Contreras retired from active duty in 1938. This slide shows his official transfer to the Fleet Reserve on the 16th of May, 1938. He continued to work on the Washington Navy Yard in a civilian capacity until 1955. So here he is, of course, in civilian clothing. He's no longer, but he's shaking the hands of the captain. But yes, he continued to work right here on your Washington Navy Yard until 1955. A retirement letter from Secretary of the Navy C.S. Thomas, dated 10 October 1955, reads, quote, during your many years of service, you have had an active role, both in military and civilian capacity, in the growth of our Navy to its present formidableness. The loyal, conscientious attitude which you have displayed in carrying out your assigned duties has made you a valuable asset to the Navy." End quote. I'd like to focus on this idea of, of Contreras as a, having a permanent appointment as a bandmaster. This is one of the first official records we have of that sort of a situation, which is certainly unique. I want to return to the idea that he was an oboist. In, in any musical ensemble, the oboe is very unique and often displays a lot of leadership qualities. And I, I want you to think today about Contreras as being a forerunner to the way the music program is organized in the present day. So I mentioned that he's an oboist. There are a few images that we have. Here is one where he's actually holding a clarinet and not an oboe. The oboe is not traditionally an instrument that you would march with. And in a lot of you know, the ensembles that your Navy music program has, marching is certainly one of the primary responsibilities that we have, whether it's parades. I know in the DC band, we do a lot of ceremonies in Arlington National Cemetery, the Memorial Day parade, inauguration. But certainly, if you don't normally march with an oboe, what does one march with? So Contreras, not only was the oboe unique, but he, he often marched with clarinet. So here's another photograph of him with the clarinet. This one I believe I showed a little bit earlier. But I want to return to the idea of the oboe being uniquely positioned for leadership. The oboe is usually the instrument that tunes the ensemble. 
You know, when a tuning note is played at the very beginning, um, the oboe is the one who carries that note, and that's a very, you know, that is the center, that is the center of the pitch, and that's, uh, you know, sometimes we'll have upwards of 60 or sometimes 70 musicians on stage, and that's a huge responsibility. So even in his first years as musician second class Contreras, he was in this leadership role in ensembles. And, you know, often oboe is playing very high, high-pitched, very exposed passages that are often very beautiful. So, but just, it, it really strikes me that even in his formative years in our Navy music program, he was always carrying a leadership role. And the idea of a permanent appointment, I want to take a second to just talk a little bit about the Navy music program that we have today. So your Navy music program includes 11 bands that are deployed around the globe. We of course have the US Navy Band, that's our Navy's flagship musical institution, based right here at the Washington Navy Yard. We also have the fantastic US Naval Academy Band in Annapolis, and nine other fleet bands deployed again at home and abroad. Uh, Newport, Rhode Island, San Diego, California, uh, Hawaii and Seventh Fleet based in Yokosuka, Japan. So there's bands all over the globe, but they have very different roles. A lot of the bands that you'll see out in the fleet, you'll be wearing many hats. You'll do some ceremonies, you'll do some perhaps like brass quintet work, you'll do uh, pop group playing, you'll do jazz ensemble stuff, but you're kind of doing a lot of different things, which in these earliest photographs of Contreras, we see he'll play oboe sometimes, he'll play clarinet when they're marching sometimes. It's a lot of different things. The DC band and the US Naval Academy band in Annapolis remain permanent appointment positions for the uh, enlisted personnel. Our officers, our limited duty officers who are absolutely second to none, they rotate duty stations the same way you would see in, in every other Navy rating. But our uh, premier band MUs, again, the DC band and the Naval Academy band are permanent duty assignments. And I just think it's so unique to see Contreras is one of the first individuals where we have a record of his permanent appointment. And I would attribute it to a couple different things. The fact that he plays oboe is extremely unique. And again, it, it would be very difficult to uh, replace. He would be in a very unique position. And that's one of the reasons why I like to view Contreras as one of the first reasons why we have the Navy music program that we have today. So Contreras was a young musician who had seen the power of the United States Navy's Great White Fleet as an opportunity to excel. He followed his dreams to serve, took the chance for a better tomorrow, and rose to the top of his profession, as evidenced by the fact that he was a permanent appointment bandmaster in the US Navy Band. Contreras' story epitomizes the idea of the United States, the United States and the United States Navy as a welcoming land of opportunity for all. Along with Chief Alton Adams, Contreras was one of the first minority bandmasters in your Navy, breaking barriers again during the World War I era that wouldn't be addressed en masse until World War II and after. In conclusion, the Great White Fleet's circumnavigation not only accomplished its primary mission, projecting power and cultivating diplomatic relationships, but the tour also inspired Bandmaster Contreras to become a U.S. citizen and pursue an inspirational and iconic career in your Navy music program. Circling back to the original Great White Fleet's crews that inspired Contreras, your Navy music program still embarks on similar operations in the present day. In 2023, your United States Navy band cruisers with the augmented ensemble you see before you, embarked on the US Navy band's first tour of Puerto Rico. Through 11 concerts, the tour reached 28,000 28, individuals, that's both live audiences and live stream viewers, and resulted in five accessions to your Navy music program. Contreras' success and that of recent OCONUS missions, like the tour you see, reinforce the idea that our Navy, the Navy music program, and international tours in particular have served as successful conduits for recruitment, citizenship, diversity, representation, and belonging. If we can't know where we're going without knowing where we've been, it is my hope that Navy Music continues these groundbreaking and diversity forward operations in the 21st century. But again, the parallels to me are striking. Contreras was a Chilean national. He saw Roosevelt's Great White Fleet. He enlisted, he became a US citizen. He rose to the absolute top of the Navy Music program as a profession. And 
in 2023, your Navy Band Cruisers toured Puerto Rico, and there were five new accessions to the Navy music program. And that's just unprecedented, and it's really, really, really exciting. So thank you so much for joining us on this little bit dreary Saturday here in our nation's capital. But you know, the archives department, we're, we're based on the mezzanine of the US Navy Band building right across the base here at the historic Washington Navy Yard. The Archives Department and your Navy Band in general, we have an incredible public affairs department. We would love to hear from you. This should be the beginning of a conversation. We're trying to, this is a connection that we hope will continue to grow. So we would love to hear from you. We have an incredible social media team. We are on Facebook, we are on Instagram. We have a great YouTube page. I mentioned that uh, we are one day after celebrating your Navy's birthday on the 13th of October. Uh, the, the band had an incredible concert and all of the information, uh, you know, they, they post so many really amazing things on social media, including our great YouTube page. So again, the Navy Band's website, navyband.navy.mil, navyband.navy.mil. If you can't remember that, just go to your favorite search engine, type in Navy Band. We're the very first thing that pops up, I promise. I check it every day to make sure we're number one, beat Army. And we just have so many amazing things going on. The, you know, your Navy bands, again, the 11 that are stationed around the world, they accomplish all kinds of different missions. In DC, we do so many things in Arlington National Cemetery. I know that our jazz ensemble, the Commodores, are about to embark on a national tour. That is one of the unique missions here at the Navy Band in DC is that uh, this band is authorized to tour nationally. And what we do there is we connect um, America with its Navy, especially in areas of the country, you know, you can't take a ship just anywhere in the country, you know, so that is what we do at your Navy band in DC is we connect America with its Navy. We're of course always honoring veterans. We play a full armed forces salute at the end of every show. All of our groups do that when they're out on tour. So it's just exciting. There's a lot of different missions that your Navy bands accomplish. I will mention, you know, if you visit our website, again, navyband.navy.mil, we're almost always hiring for one of those 11 bands. If you or a loved one is interested in serving your country in this very unique and amazing way, please visit our website, navyband.navy.mil. Go on over to our vacancies page and check out all the information you have. So again, I'm, I'm very honored to be the head archivist for Navy Music. My work as archivist is never done. There's never an end to it. We're always trying to find new things and we're always interested in, in different items. You know, I mentioned that 1927 NBC radio show that I'm still looking for a recording of. But if, if, if you're out there and you, you hear this and you have any information about Bandmaster Contreras, we're always interested in bolstering our collections in any way and just learning more uh, and telling that Navy story and telling the story of fantastic sailors like Bandmaster Contreras. I did bring a lot of the things that you have seen today. I brought uh, original copies up here. They are in uh, archival sleeves, so they will be available for supervised viewing uh, for anyone interested. Uh, but again, thank you so much to the Navy Museum. Thank you so much to Paul Perry. Thank you so much to everyone at the Navy Museum for making this possible. Your Navy Band is always super excited to, to partner with uh, the Navy Museum in every way we can. So thank you so much for your time. Again, I'm Chief Kevin McDonald. This has been a fantastic opportunity to present on Bandmaster Belisario Contreras, and we hope you have a wonderful time, and thank you very much for joining us. And with that, I'm happy to open it up for questions if there happen to be any. Yes.